everybody, welcome to episode 22 of Life and My Family. This is a very, very quick intro, just to say that um, today's episode will be mostly helmed by Julian Charles of the Mind Renew. This is a swapcast, as you will hear him say in a second. I've appeared on TMR many times. If you trawl through their archives, you'll see me pop up at various times talking about things within the propaganda envelope, let's say. But we have branched off a couple of times over the years. And uh, I was just on the show recently. We did, um, as part of a movie roundtable, we did uh, Capricorn 1, which is a... and a conspiracy thriller, if you want to call it that, from the 1970s. So that was Julian's last episode. So the world has been very weird on many, many levels the last couple of years. And let me make it clear before you listen to this that Julian and I are in no way COVID deniers or any of those other nasty tags. But we do mention tags and labels during the show. So we're just people who have an instinct to question things. And I'm meeting more and more people who are like that. Makes you feel less like a freak. <laughs> There'll be no outro to this. I'll just let Julian's outro to his show play out. But just tell you the next episode of Life and Life Only, and surely the last one of 2021, is going to be looking at Nick Drake. And if you've been following me on social media and my work in general, you'll know that I've just appeared on a podcast talking about that. It was last month, I think. But there was plenty more to get into. And it's shaping up to be my longest podcast ever across any of my shows. Anyway, That'll be to come, but for now, I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Julian Charles. So, till next time, enjoy. Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And welcome to TMR number 273, and also a certain number of the Life and Life Only podcast, because this is in fact a swap cast with uh, Anthony Rutuno's uh, podcast, because Anthony Rutuno joins us today for a conversation which I don't quite know how this is going to go because we have just got masses of notes here to discuss on the subject of propaganda in the COVID era. And whether it will be called that, I don't know. But uh, as you can imagine, we have been bombarded with propaganda over the last couple of years to such an extent that once I started, well, both of us, when we started thinking about this, we realized heavens above, there is so much here. So I have, as I just said to Anthony before we started, I have more notes here than I have for anything else I've ever done on the show, which tells you something. Um, so, uh, Anthony, welcome to the show. Then. Thanks for joining us again. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Yes. Two in a row. I was on the last one as well, wasn't I? Yeah. Yeah. And this is technically a swap cast. So yeah, this is Life and Life Only episode uh, 528 <laughs> minus about 502. <laughs> yeah. Something like episode 20. Something. I don't know. I think you just demonstrated uh, the uselessness of these numbers, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's say off the bat to sort of um, make ourselves feel better. Yes, we have got too much here mm. and we're just going to let it go and let let the magic happen because we've talked so much over the last seven years now. We know we'll spark each other off. Absolutely. But yeah, there is just so much to get into. We don't even know what propaganda means, do we? We haven't still quite... <laughs> we've got dictionary definitions, but we're still not sure, and mm. we'll get into that. <laughs> we will. We'll get into definitions in, in a minute. And I'm going to, again, apologise for the amount of stuff that we've got here. But, you know, I was racking my brains to think, how do I categorise these things so that it's a nice, well-structured conversation? No, 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 no. All these things interconnect. It's like a spider's web. So we'll just go wherever we end up going in the conversation. And before we get going on definitions and things like that, I just want to say that, uh, interestingly enough, Anthony and I are on either side of the, not the ideology, but just the sheer fact of being vaccinated or not vaccinated, uh, that is COVID-19 vaccinated. Anthony has been and I haven't been, and it's got nothing to do with deep belief in you, everybody, you know, that's the answer to everything, or no, no, it's, it's the worst thing in the world. It's nothing like that. It's just the sheer facts that either of us stand either side of the pharmaceutical intervention. And I thought it'd be interesting to mention that because I think that will help to break this very common view that you have to be one side 100% or the other. And it will also be interesting to see how that colours the conversation that we have here today. 
So shall we get on to definitions? Because if we're going to talk about propaganda, we need to know what that means. Mm -hmm. But what I want to avoid is getting into a kind of semantic debate about what the accepted definitions are, because this would be entering into an academic debate. And of course, always the case with academic debates that it goes on forever, back and forth for generations. So all that is sufficient is that you and I have an agreement as to what we mean. As long as we know what we're talking about, that's all that actually matters. So do you want to give us an idea of what you mean by propaganda? Oh, dear. Uh, Well, I'm going to say with a caveat that we know vaguely what we mean, but it's a little bit uh, flexible, really. So, I mean, I don't have a dictionary definition here, but that would say to do with persuasion and using deception. Yeah. But I'd like to perhaps broaden it out slightly. Mm. In a funny way, we all use propaganda on each other. And I don't think we're trying to necessarily deceive each other or create a bad outcome for each other. But if you broaden propaganda out to mean persuasion or influence, Mm. see, this is the problem with words, you see. (laughs) Yeah, well, I I kind of, can I just say that I reckon those words get close to the meaning, but I think a better word is manipulate, actually. Sorry to (laughs) interrupt you there, but we can can persuade, can't we, by using reason, by respecting the person that we're talking to. Yeah. But we can also persuade in a manipulative way where that crosses a line where we're not quite so comfortable with that. And I think that's where it becomes propaganda. Let me just share with you something I distilled really from reading Jacques Ellul's work on propaganda, which I do recommend to people. It's Propaganda, the Formation of Men's Attitudes, written back in 1965. Mm -hmm. Um, Very prescient work. Um, Sort of distilled from the kinds of things he talks about. He was a French philosopher sociologist, theologian, Christian anarchist. So I'm saying it's something like this based upon his thinking. Propaganda is language. It's language based. So it can be words or the written word, spoken word, written word, but also can include images and symbols that function as language. So it's language that is designed to manipulate. So it does not respect the integrity of the person who receives the propaganda. It does not seek the consent of the person who is receiving it. It may appeal to reason, but not legitimately. It's only interested in reason insofar as it achieves its objective, which is to manipulate. And this is a particular thing from Elul, and that is that propaganda seeks primarily to change behavior. Mm. Now, that's something I'd not thought about before reading his work. I thought of it in terms of just changing thought. Now, obviously, it is about changing people's thinking. But as far as Elul is concerned, it's primarily aimed at changing behavior and the change of thought can happen as, as a result of change of behavior. And I just thought that that's rather interesting. It's, it's mm. a, a blunter instrument in some cases than I thought it was. Um, and interestingly, it doesn't matter whether what it advocates is true or false. Mm. Um, it's the method that makes it propaganda. So you can propagandize something that is really a true message. But if you go about it in this manipulative way and you don't respect your audience, then you are being a propagandist. And as you say, we can all do this in a small way in our own lives. Perhaps we should guard ourselves against that. Hmm. That all sounds very conscious. But what about, uh, well, psychology would tell you that unconscious behavior is a more higher percentage of behavior is is unconscious. So I guess that's not necessarily propaganda, but things like shaming people into taking vaccines. Hmm. You're not necessarily trying to deceive them, but there's definitely in this COVID era, we've seen a great deal of that. There must be something else. I guess that's not propaganda. Is there a word for that? I don't know. I would say that's the internalization of propaganda that's already happening around you. Oh, okay, okay. You know, you are being instructed that it's the right thing to shame people. And if you internalize that, you'll end up doing that. It will change. Yes, yeah, changing your behavior and the way you think. Hmm. So you can unwittingly be part of the propaganda. You can become a tool of propaganda. Hmm. Yeah, and I think the very, very first time we talked was about changing the discourse I'm not going to get all nostalgic here, by the way, but uh, (laughs) uh, we were talking about how um, we don't know if people under the surface are thinking much more profound thoughts than they express. In fact, one of the quotes, it's a Spy B quote, we can do it later if you want, but it's uh, they actually identify that individuals don't come to their opinions through private contemplation. You must have come across that. It's like the Bernays thing. They realize that people do need to be managed. Bernays back in 1929, was it? realize that people don't really meditate on these things, meditate as in think deeply on these things. 
So they would say that propaganda is actually necessary, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. It's just that it goes beyond this level; it becomes very egregious, you know. But、um, well, well, I would like to see a world without propaganda. Really,、mm. <laughs> um, I suppose one of the things that Alul says is that you know you have a, an advanced society, a technological society. In order for that to function, then a level of propaganda is necessary for that to work.、Um, mm. Well, to a certain extent, then that's. I think that's a critique of the very society in which we live.、Mm. You know, the, the power structures that we have, that propaganda becomes necessary to uphold those structures. Well, perhaps those structures themselves need to be critiqued and perhaps abandoned. There we are. That's making me a bit of a, an anarchist when he has anarchistic tendencies himself.、Mm. Does a little. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I've got a little bit of that as well. But、uh, <laughs> I suppose then, if yeah. you, so you're saying if you. Let's say if you banned mainstream television, which I don't think would be a bad thing at all,、uh, <laughs> what would people do without someone to trigger a thought? I sent you the、um, Tony Gosling clip, didn't I,、oh. about the Iraq War? If you remember, he was on he was on a radio phone in. It was the first day of the original the Gulf War, the nineteen ninety one one. Yeah. So they said the phone in.、Uh, what, what do you think about the war?、Uh, And they just sort of said, "What do you think about the war?" And they noticed that the panel thing wasn't lighting up; like nobody was calling in. And his producer said, "Yeah, but you haven't presented them with a couple of options to argue against." So then they change it to,、uh, "What do you think? Do you think Saddam Hussein's a monster, or do you think we should stay out of the Gulf War?" And it all lit up. <laughs> It's such a brilliant anecdote from Tony Gosling.、Mm. So I think I'd agree with you, but then I don't know. I, th- I think maybe the masses are so conditioned to having opinions for them to react against, because that's really what this COVID era is about. I think. Yeah, but then you could say, you know, you say they've been conditioned, and that's what I would argue against. We shouldn't be conditioned, you know.、Um, I suppose I'm arguing for a new kind of society. Oh sure, I'm just wondering how long that transition would take, and what would happen in the in the interim. Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> As if we didn't have、uh, it. No, I think we just have to accept that we are living in a sea of propaganda,、um, mm. and if we are aware of it, then we can become less prone to it. Absolutely.、Um, and I think that's the most that we, you know, we're not going to change the world overnight. But if we can、uh, navigate through this world without being so manipulated, then that's a good thing, and persuade other people to be less manipulated. And of course, propaganda is not the whole thing. As I, I think I said before, the interview propaganda, as far as I see it, is a subset of social engineering.、Mm. And this is the broader category. No doubt, we're going to be talking about things that spill over into the broader category because we're going to be talking about、um, nudge theory and the nudge units,、um, mm. and they are really aimed mostly at changing people's context, people's environment, so that they behave in different ways.、Mm. So propaganda is is a, is a subset of that. It's about using language to change people's behavior and thinking. Now, one of the things that tipped us off to talking about this. Although we kind of had it in mind anyway, but really crystallised the idea of having this conversation was the presentation or series of presentations by Mark Crispin Miller,、mm. who is a professor of media studies at New York University, who's been subject to censorship himself. It's been a very difficult time for him,、mm. um, and he's often referred to as a public intellectual. Although, of course, his Wikipedia page calls him a conspiracy theorist, but、um, <laughs> of course, <laughs>、uh, typical of、uh, Wikipedia.、Um, so, I mean, he gave these really interesting video presentations, which you can find on Off Guardian.、Um, he gives a very broad. Perspective of how propaganda has been really extreme in the last year or so,、mm. but that it fits into a larger trajectory of propaganda that's been going on and growing, intensifying over the decades. And he goes as far back as well, I suppose a hundred years ago and talks about the propaganda against the Hun,、mm. World War One era, and the Hun, of course, would be identified with a nation. Yeah. Then, of course, you move on to the communists,、mm. and that's not a nation. That's denationalised. It's becoming a little bit vaguer. I like the way he talks about this.、Mm. So then you can start talking about these people, the communists being among us, the the enemy within, the fifth columnist. And there's a wonderful quote that he brings up from Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover,、mm. first FBI director. Where he talks in these terms, but he also starts to medicalise the language,、mm. so you can see where this is going. <laughs> And we're living in this medicalised era at the moment. Let me just bring up this quote. I love this quote.、Um, it's quite creepy, really.、Mm. Hoover said, "Communism in reality is not a political party. It's a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease、yeah. that spreads like an epidemic." 
and like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. Mm. <laughs> so that kind of mentality was growing there back in the 1950s. Mm. <laughs> he then moves on to the terrorism era, post 9-11, where you have the war on terror. So the enemy becomes a real abstraction. So it's now, your war is not on the communists. You know, it's actually war on an abstract noun terror mm. <laughs> um, so it really has become very very ethereal by now so anything anyone anywhere can be considered to be an enemy of the state and this really reminds me of what david cameron was talking about a few years back where basically anybody who thinks non-official thoughts can be associated with isis you know non-official thoughts i love that that's a great phrase <laughs> yeah you have to go to the doctor and say oh doctor i'm having non-official thoughts <laughs> He's like, don't worry, I prescribe four hours of the BBC. <laughs> wow, it's getting like that, isn't it? I love that. That's a great phrase you've come up with there. <laughs> Thank you very much. You, know, you mentioned 9-11 conspiracy theories and the 7-7 conspiracy theory. And he's, he's saying something like, this is a poison that yeah. can feed into the ideology of ISIS. I'm like, what? What's going on there? It's just, if you've got the wrong ideas, yeah, unofficial thoughts, then somehow you're equated with terrorism. So it's become so abstract that it can be, and so vague, it can be applied to anybody. Yeah. Um, which then sets the stage really nicely for the vague, ethereal virus, <laughs> invisible threat that's lurking around every door, on every surface, the hand of your loved one, mm. and then this weird thing called asymptomatic transmission. There's no evidence you've got anything whatsoever, but you're still a danger. I think he calls it a kind of voodoo. It's become a magical thing. Yeah, he did say, I think he did say voodoo, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I love that very broad trajectory that he traces there, mm. where these ideas have sort of piled on one after the other, and the status has thought, yeah, you know, the vaguer it becomes, the more powerful it is, the more we can manipulate it. And you can, you can really see that growing, can't you, that trajectory? Yeah. A lot of what he was saying, it, it was sort of stuff that we'd said, but it was just very, very well presented. Yeah, his, the video, 2020 um, propaganda masterpiece. And then can I summarise a couple of things about Mr. Crispin Miller? Absolutely, yeah. I think he described himself like 10 or however many years ago. He, he was edgy but acceptable. He was probably somewhere where Chomsky would be viewed in the mainstream, you know, a bit wacky, but mm. nothing too terrible. Mm. And it's interesting that he has, because he's modified his ideas a bit, he's just gone further and further out. And I think it was actually one of his students, because he had a propaganda course mm. that he used to do. Mm. And one of his students, without telling him, I think, went on Twitter and started complaining. Oh. And she joined the class late or something, and she didn't get the context of the earlier lectures. So she just came into it, heard this thing that sounded like conspiracy theory, and then sort of grasped him up on social media. Okay. <laughs> Can you believe it? Yeah, um, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you and I, we've talked so much about conspiracy theories, and I'm sure your listeners and my listeners know about the CIA document from 1967. But he actually said something that I didn't think about, which was that before the 60s, people used to talk about conspiracy theories quite openly. It wasn't considered wacky. It was more of a curiosity. Hmm. But he said it was when the phrase got invented, conspiracy theorist, rather than just theory. So suddenly you were tagged. You were a person with a, a warped mind having unofficial thoughts. Mm. I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Your phrase there. It's very interesting. You know, you mentioned things like disease and illness. I had mentioned like an allergic reaction. Mm. Mm. So, oh, it's conspiracy theories. And it's literally like having a rush. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And we've been trained to think that way. Mm. And it's pretty clear. This is not something that has just happened. Um, it's clear that governments have used their behavioural psychology advisors to influence the way we think and the way we behave. And this has been going on, well, it's been going on for years, but really on steroids to medicalise even that comment over the last <laughs> couple of years. And um, mm. so... Obviously, as we're in the UK, we're going to be UK-centred in what we talk about here. Um, I wanted to mention these nudge units, which we have mentioned before on the show. Um, mm. They employ nudge theory, which essentially is social engineering. It's about trying to change the context in maybe small ways, maybe bigger ways, in which people live their lives and behave. And if you change the context, then you're nudging people to do things and particularly do things, but also think things that they might otherwise not do, not think. 
Um, so this nudge concept apparently was popularized by, of all people, Cass Sunstein <laughs> um, and Richard Thaler in a 2008 book called Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness. Yeah, isn't that lovely? Improving decisions. Mm. So yeah, Cass Sunstein, um, as far as I'm concerned, an arch propagandist, of course, wrote that mm. article with Adrian Vermula, famously back in also 2008, I think it was, called Conspiracy Theory, where they were advocating cognitive infiltration of conspiracy theory groups. <laughs> yeah, so that kind of guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So nudge theory then, is, as I say, is about applying behavioral science, behavioral psychology to economics, politics, to nudge people in the supposedly right direction, whatever those in charge want to achieve, um, or just to reinforce behavior. Um, and there's some lovely examples of this. The most amusing one, I think, it's on the Wikipedia page about this, is of a urinal where uh, somebody has printed a little image of a fly. And, of course, what that does is it helps people to aim because they will tend to uh, aim for the fly, and so there'll be less spillage on the floor. Uh, so you can see how that works. You know, it does actually change your behavior <laughs> in a very, very subtle way. Mm. So this kind of nudge theory, then, is employed by these nudge units. The most famous one, the inaugural one, being the Behavioral Insights Team mm. here in the UK, set up in 2010 to apply this theory within British government. And if you go to their website, Behavioural Insights Team website, you find, they say, we generate and apply behavioural insights to inform policy, yeah. improve public services, and deliver results for citizens and society. But just that first clause there, we generate and apply behavioural insights to inform policy. Yeah. Yeah, so manipulation. <laughs> How the government can get what it wants through manipulating the populace, basically. And then these are all over the place now. Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, France. Well, so what would be um, another example of a nudge? Uh, I was looking at it, it said social distancing markers, for example. Yeah. But is that is that telling you what to do? Or hmm? what would you, um, how would you define a nudge? Is it something subtle or is it? It can be subtle or unsubtle. It's any change of context that delivers a change of behavior. Uh, and that's yeah. exactly that, isn't it? If you, if you see some marks on the ground, you're more likely to do what those marks tell you to do. So if they're two metres apart, you're more likely... People are going to disobey it, but on the whole, people are more likely to stand two metres apart yeah. or follow the arrows. And that's not a very subtle one, is it? <laughs> you know? yeah. But as long as it achieves its objective, a more subtle one will come from the world of advertising, which we've talked about before. Yeah. Everybody knows about it, so its subtlety is blown. But putting sweets, you know, down at a low level <laughs> next to the till when... Oh, yeah. You know, mum or dad is there <laughs> paying for everything and the little kid is going, oh, I want some sweets because they're there at that level. Yeah. And then it gets into the nagging thing. and But that's a nudge, isn't it? So that's applied to economics, to the business world. Um, I was just going to say that they've used a wonderfully sort of innocuous sounding word, you know, oh, just a little nudge. Oh, absolutely. Nothing to see here. And uh, it's funny you mentioned nag because I had that in my notes. The nag factor in the corporation was it was sort of fairly innocuous name, and you had that woman with the permanent smile going, "Oh yeah, nagging works really well," you know. And yes. I've seen it with my sisters who both had kids. You know, it's a nightmare yeah. taking a child around a supermarket. But nag just sounds very nice. And this whole thing is to do with behavioural economics, which is just fascinating. Mm. It's got nothing to do with economics. It's purely psychology, really. It's the idea that standard economics says that people are rational when they make predictable decisions but actually if you think about things that can influence people so yeah for the listeners behavioral economics rory sutherland there's a name for you mm. do some research you'll love it <laughs> what about people as nudges because surely then in true propaganda style ideas are presented and then don't we all nudge each other absolutely and this is one of the examples now is it, is it on the behavioral insights i'm not sure this might be a product of there's so many things. No, no, it might be the Mindspace document. Mm. One of the authors of the Mindspace document is the head of the Behavioural Insights team. So this is David Halpern. Mm. So yeah, this is nudge stuff. So the mind, in the Mindspace document, there's an example of somebody going to have lunch with their mates. Mm. You know, they're working in an office and they're working on a document about healthy eating or something. And then it's lunchtime and the mates say, oh, you're coming to lunch. And then um, they go to the canteen and somebody just... Puts, I can't remember the details, but you know, somebody put some 
stew or something on the plate and then uh, as a consequence of that uh, somebody else is having potatoes so you decide to have potatoes as well and then there's a space left on the tray and you think oh okay puts a, a bottle of coke on there or something you know th- so people are influencing each other's behavior for sure in that example and so the point of this document is to say look people do alter and change people's behaviors how can we use that <laughs> to affect what uh, mm. policy desires yeah, and I mean, behavioural economics has really proved, you know, the, the real masters of it have proved that we are actually very malleable, you know. Mm. Again, Mark Christian Miller said this, but I, this is something I've been thinking as well. Any good human nature book will tell you that people hate to admit they've been duped. Yes. We, we almost need like a propaganda anonymous. You know, we <laughs> yeah. go to a group and we stand up at the beginning and I say, my name's Anthony and I'm susceptible to propaganda. <laughs> as in with alcoholics, that's half the battle. Mm. You've got to understand that we are all malleable. And if we, you know, we let our egos take over, then we are preventing any kind of progress because we're sort of buying into it. But yeah. it's natural, you know, it's, apparently it's human nature. I never know what human nature means because <laughs> if you think that we've been conditioned to one degree or another through our whole existence, then mm-hmm. what's human mm-hmm. nature? <laughs> I don't know. But you ask anyone, it's very, very <laughs> rare that you'll find someone who say, oh, yeah, actually I was wrong. You know, actually, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, I mm-hmm. can be duped. Mm. Anyway, mm. I think you're absolutely right. The idea of a yeah, kind of Alcoholics Anonymous thing, we're, we're brilliant to sort of detoxify mm. because this is not just something that happens as a consequence of human nature. This is deliberately exploited. And Elul talks about this in the book. And he says that one of the characteristics of propaganda is that everybody must participate in the narrative, whatever that is, be made to participate in it. So once you start participating, whatever that might be, mm. let's just say, because I'm going to say that I think masks function primarily as propaganda. Once you get everybody participating in this, mm-hmm. then it's very difficult for a lot of people to see that that is an act of propaganda because they're invested in it. Mm. The same also, I would argue, for many people, not everybody, but many people with vaccination. Mm. If they take it as a consequence of propaganda, I think, oh, this must be the right thing to do. Or, oh, you know, people will think I'm bad if I don't. And that kind of thing, rather than thinking, yeah, this is a health choice. I'm persuaded by this and I'll act upon this. Well, fair enough. Mm. But if it's done as a consequence of propaganda, then you're bought into, you internalize that propaganda and you've actually participated in that narrative, then it's incredibly difficult to break that. And the propagandist knows that mm. they're exploiting human nature. Yeah, sure. This is one of the terrifying things about, I think, what's going on is that people are so bought into the ideology of this, it's almost impossible to have a conversation. Hmm. It's a sort of mixture of an instinct to comply and an instinct to be included as well, isn't it? Mm. When you've got those two things working together, I mean, you can, like I say, you can really make people do things. And of course, you've got the mass media behind you. So, mm. so it's a sort of ceding to authority and a feeling of inclusion and another aspect, yet another aspect, is the idea that if you go against the tide, you're you're also some sort of party pooper. Mm. People mm. buy into these things that sound really cool, like, oh, you know, today is Mother's Day, today is whoever's day. And you're the party pooper yes. who says, because I did, did have a girlfriend, and I said to her, I'm not going to take you out on Valentine's Day, because <laughs> I'm not going to be told that I have to take my girlfriend out and pay double on February the 14th. So I said to her, every day could be Valentine's Day. Just pick a day and I'll take you out that day, you know, (laughs) as a special thing. (laughs) Good point. uh, That's a really good example, Mm. isn't it? Yes, it's a very rational approach. Why should you go according to what the advertiser wants you to do? Exactly. Yeah, so you've got to just guard against it. And uh, I think like little acts of rebellion, let's say, Mm. again, circling back to our very first conversation a few years ago, I think people pick up on your behavior. You don't necessarily have to tell them but someone might see you in a in a public space would say, oh, that person's not complying. I kind of like that. I admire that. That's not really propaganda on our part. <laughs> it's just behavior. And you don't always have to tell people stuff. When the prevailing thing is compliance and, you know, suddenly the Tories aren't bad, we're going to do everything they tell us. <laughs> and there's all these nudges going on. It's very difficult to swim against the tide. It always is, you know. Yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up on, you were saying about, pressures upon us to conform and Mm. you know not be the party pooper and all that sort of thing this is explicitly the sort of thing that the mind space document picks up on so this is produced by the institute for government and the cabinet office so it's called mind space influencing behavior through public policy Mm. and uh, they give lots of areas for policy experts to look at as to how to influence our behavior 
it really connects to what you've just been saying. So um, this is how the acronym Mindspace is, is actually created. They have messenger, incentives, norms, defaults, salience, priming, affect, commitments, ego. Wow. Let me just quickly go through those. Yeah. So messenger. It says we are heavily influenced by who communicates information. So I'm thinking, ah, there's been a lot of talk about trying to get vaccine uptake by having personalities and respected people in society persuading people to be vaccinated. So this comes out of this, you see, messenger. Then we have incentives. Yeah. Our responses to incentives are shaped by predictable mental shortcuts, such as strongly avoiding losses. Well, that connects straight away to fear. Make everybody afraid. You don't want to lose. Mm. Then we have norms. We are strongly influenced by what others do. So one of the most powerful things I've thought for many years, I thought, is this insistence that what everybody thinks such and such. Mm. So if you repeat that, people are going to think, mm, well, that must be the norm. I must go along with that. Yeah, the myth of public consensus, you could call it. E yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. They're actually advocating this. Yeah. Then we have defaults. We go with the flow of preset options. I think we've already talked about this. So if you set kind of false dichotomy or false trichotomy and you, you exclude the other options, then people will think, mm -hmm, I've got these to choose from. And they will go with that flow of options. Mm. Uh, salience. Our attention is drawn to what's novel, seems relevant to us. Very novel, Minister. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, the, the virus itself was called novel, if you remember. Oh, like, yeah. oh, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, there's some novel aspects to it, but it's a coronavirus. They've been around for how many millions of years or whatever. Um, but no, this one's novel. Yeah. I mean, they're all novel in a sense, aren't they? Because they'll all be different in some way. But this, just to call that novel, made us very concentrated upon it. Mm. Uh, priming, our acts are often influenced by subconscious cues. Well, that one is really important. I mean, we've been talking about mask wearing and distancing. These are cues. We may not be thinking about what we're seeing, mm. um, but they're going to cue us to behave in certain ways. And let me just, before I carry on with that, I don't, I don't want to be... I've already talked about this with Phil Saker, but I don't want it to be seen that I am anti-mask, you know, in a medical sense. Mm. I'm not particularly persuaded that they're medically very effective. And I think actually the disbenefits in terms of their propaganda value outweigh any medical benefit that they might have. So my objection really is that they are functioning, particularly now, they've just been brought back again with this Omicron variant. Mm. They're functioning as propaganda and I object to that. They are functioning as a form of speech to say obey and, and I'm complying and you're not and this sort of thing. And I object to that in principle. So that's why I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be wearing a mask. Okay. So that's priming subconscious cues. Yeah. Affect our emotional associations can powerfully shape our actions. Okay. Emotional associations. <laughs> well, all kinds of stuff could be brought up with that. Um, commitments. We seek to be consistent with our public promises and reciprocal acts. We've already talked about this. You know, if we can be, mm. if we can be made to be actually involved in the propaganda, then we're going to carry on being consistent with that because we don't want to be seen as a hypocrite. So if we've been pro mask wearing, let's say, or pro social distancing, I call it anti social distancing, mm. um, then we're going to be still pro that, aren't we? You know, because we've Otherwise, we'd be a hypocrite. And then lastly, ego. Yeah. We act in ways that make us feel better about ourselves. So we've been constantly messaged about, you know, if we ob obey the government, we're the good people. Yeah, we can pat ourselves on our back. Yeah. So, I mean, you can see how all of those yeah. feed straight into public policy and how they've been working um, to manipulate us. Yeah. It's very clear. Yeah, I mean, they're not hiding anything. I mean, no, they're probably just banking on the fact that's not most people's idea of a good evening, is it, to read that? <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, I find it, I find it fascinating, but, and you do as well. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. one of the things you said that was interesting about if you put an idea in someone's head and then they start owning it, that's essentially what salespeople do, mm. depending what they're selling. The idea is that um, when the person takes ownership of the idea they will then steadfastly go with it. So the salesman trick is to essentially plant an idea in someone's head and then make them think that it's their idea. Mm. And then they go full bore with it. Clearly they're using psychology and they're not hiding it. No. And as I've said, essentially, when you start using psychologists, you realize that they know more about us than we do, which is very <laughs> right, right. scary. Yeah. I mean, we might know with our conscious mind what we're doing, but when they've actually got underneath that, mm. whoa, that's a problem because again, people will not be aware of that. Number one, and if you, even if they are, they won't admit it. Mm. The ego will come in. And, mm. yeah. Well, very scary. You say that 
they're quite open about it. In a sense, they are. This is published. You could just download it, but um, not open. This is Laura Doddsworth, one of her points, and she wrote State of Fear. One of her points is that, you know, we've not been asked about this. Mm. There's not been open in the sense of, look, mm. put this forward as a, as a policy for the British people to consider. Do we want to be nudged in these kinds of ways? Do we think that's a good thing? We've never been asked about this. Mm. This is a very technocratic sort of attitude. We, we know what's best. We'll do this and we, we'll do it in such a way that it won't tread so far as to be noticed too much so that people would object to it too much. But we'll, yes, okay, we'll, we'll publish it so that it's quite open about it. Because that's not being open, is it? You know, not really. Mm. It's um, hidden in plain sight, really. Just open um, in the sense of that for people who are interested in studying it, it is all yeah. laid out there. But yeah, like I say, it's not going to be given much emphasis. I think that's another media trick, isn't it? Someone like our, our friend James Corbett, he's considered very alternative, but a lot of what he gets will come from mainstream media. Yes. It's just not given any prominence. So that's another thing, yeah. I'm quite sure there'll be some people who said, what we've just been talking about here, this Mindspace document, will think, well, that's conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though you can download it, um, it's come from the Cabinet Office and you can read it. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. Well, there was a clip of uh, on Australian TV of the Great Reset, and they were saying, "Oh, don't worry, it's a conspiracy theory," <laughs> and it was already actually out there officially yeah. acknowledged. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> this term conspiracy theory in this in this environment we're in now, you know, it's been lumped together with all sorts of things, hasn't it? You know, mm. anti-vax, anti-vax, COVID denier. Uh, refused Nick. There, there are lots of phrases, aren't there, like that, which all mean the same kind of thing. Deplorable, basically, is what it means, isn't it? You're a deplorable. And there's a, mm. a great example of this. Um, there's a guy who's the head of the Northern Territory in Australia. I can't think of his name just at the moment. Um, there's a, a recent video of him. It really does epitomize this. Okay. He's asked a question about people who are against COVID-19 vaccine mandates. And he goes wide-eyed and he says, anybody who is against these mandates is an anti-vaxxer, he says. I don't care whether they're vaccinated or not. Hmm. They're absolutely an anti-vaxxer, he says. I mean, it makes no sense what's... I mean, it's purely Orwellian language at that point because it, it means exactly the opposite, you know. I mean, <laughs> if you've taken both doses and you're having your booster or whatever, how can you be said to be an anti-vaxxer in any sense? I'm going to object to the term anti-vaxxer anyway because it, mm. strictly, as far as I'm concerned, it should mean that you're against all vaccines. Um, so if you've got concerns about the current one, how does that make you an anti-vaxxer? Mm. Anyway, he's applying it to anybody who has taken every single vaccine that's on offer. But if you're against the mandates... Yeah. You're an anti-vaxxer. It makes no sense. It's just used as a propaganda term, mm. like denier, conspiracy theorist, where it's lost any reasonable meaning. It's just a, wow. a verbal force at that point. I'm not sure there's... Um, um, and you can see it in his eyes as well. Um, I'm not sure there's too many... I'm quite hopeful, actually, though, because I, I'm not sure there's too many young people... We're still young, obviously, but... Uh, <laughs> no, no I, you know, I've got to the point where I exclude myself from that category. <laughs> oh, right, right, no. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's too many, say, people in their like, 20s and 30s, whatever. I don't think there's too many people now in England, from what I can gauge, who actually do just go on to mainstream websites and just believe it all. You know, and I've talked a little bit to my nephews and my niece about this, that they're not really... They don't really study too many alternatives, but, you know, when they were at school, uh, I would sometimes talk to them, and young people are very aware of these ideas. Right. Just a very quick nod back to the last episode, the Capricorn One. Mm. If you remember, Peter Hyams, a director, one of the quotes was, because he worked on the Apollo 11, didn't he? But his quote that I really liked was, uh, mm. you know, I come from the generation where people just got their daily paper and believed it, and then television came along and was even more persuasive. People just basically believed it. So the, the sort of sceptical era has been very, very recent. And uh, I mentioned earlier I have a meetup group, and there's a guy who's actually 78 years old, but he's a, he's a wonderful guy. He's an author, and he's very, very open-minded. But just in that one area, he's fairly off that mindset because he doesn't use the internet either. <laughs> right. Or as little as he can. But um, there's still a hangover among, let's say, older generations of this idea that the powers that be are basically trustworthy, but... I tell you, it's changing quite fast, I think. I'm quite hopeful. That's good. Isn't it? I mean, the internet is a mm. big part of that, hence the desire to censor, clamp down on the internet, which we've got to fight as much as we possibly can, moving to different platforms and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, the powers that should not be very aware that this is the case. <laughs> I love that phrase. Um, <laughs> if you go back to Jacques Ellul writing in the 1960s, 
He talks about modern propaganda. Well, that's modern at the time. Mm. Modern propaganda always addressing the individual as part of the group. Mm. So things like radio, TV are ideal for that because you're sitting there passively listening, watching. You think you're on your own. And in fact, you're not really because although you are being addressed as an individual, you are part of a group because there are thousands or even millions of people watching or listening at the same time. Mm. And so the propagandist is actually using the group feelings and the group myths, group motivations that you all share to some extent to manipulate you as an individual. Now, the internet has broken that, hasn't it? Um, it's mm. moved away uh, because you are choosing to sit in front of a particular web page. You've chosen that yourself. Yeah. And the group of people who are also watching that, different points in history, you know, different points in time, you know, come from different cultures, different backgrounds, have different worldviews, etc. So there's, it does actually break a lot of those background conditioning things that the propagandist traditionally was using through the sort of mass communication. So, yeah, I agree with you. The internet, insofar as it is not censored successfully, mm. is a great thing. Breaks the power of the propagandist. Yeah. I had one quote from Spy B, which I thought was interesting. Um, mm. Individuals rarely come to their understandings alone or through private contemplation and calculation. Rather, they draw on socially shared understandings that are current in their communities and societies. There it is. That struck a chord while you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So yeah. it's clear that, again, they understand this clearly. So for anyone who might be listening to this and thinking, oh, these two guys think they're so, you know, they're, they're so superior in the way they think. And that we're generalizing about society. Of course, we're generalizing because we, we haven't met everyone, <laughs> have we? But, oh, no, um, no, no, and I think we said before, we, we both admit that we are subject to propaganda as well. Absolutely, yeah. I'll go to Propaganda Anonymous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're not immune to this, but that doesn't mean we can't rise to a certain level of awareness and begin to critique mm. insofar as we do become aware of this. I'm quite sure there are big areas I'm completely unaware of. I hope I will become aware of them gradually. But uh, sure. yeah, you know, we're not being egotistical about this. We're not being arrogant about this. But we shouldn't keep our mouths shut just because we don't know everything. <laughs> Let me just define what Spy B is. Um, mm. So this is the Scientific Pandemic Insights Group on Behaviours, hence the acronym or the initialism SPY-B. Um, so this is a subgroup of SAGE, or it was, or I don't know, I don't want to talk about the particular hookups. Anyway, it's connected to SAGE, um, which is the Scientific Advisory Group to the UK government. And they say, this is quoting from them, SPY-B provides behavioural science advice mm aimed at anticipating and helping people adhere to interventions that are recommended by medical or epidemiological experts. So there you go. It's behavioral science again, mm -hmm. getting people to do what you want. And in this case, getting people to go along with these interventions. Um, and they talk about things like social approval, social disapproval, tailoring the message to particular people using their motivational levers. The really striking one, which is very famous, this is from a document, published March 2020, mm. they talk about the perceived threat not being high enough in people's minds. So they say, quote, yeah. perceived threat. A substantial number of people still do not feel sufficiently personally threatened. The perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased yep. <laughs> among those who are complacent using hard-hitting emotional messaging. In other words, <laughs> scare the living daylights out of all of us to, to get us to go along. That's foul. I have to say, that's foul. Yeah. I mean... If we were asked, would you like to be scared mm. out of your wits? Vote yes or no. I think most people would say, no, thanks very much. I'd like to stay thinking rationally about things, you know. So that was pretty offensive, I think. Yeah. Yeah, imagine going to your local uh, local government saying, <laughs> I, I don't feel afraid enough. Can you, can I have some propaganda, please? <laughs> yes, that'll be £10. <laughs> But yeah, you're right. I wrote that down as well. Yeah. It's like a scene from Monty Python, that one, isn't it? It is, yeah. No, I was only laughing while you were saying that, because it is, it is terrible. Mm. But sometimes you have to laugh somehow. Yeah. Call it a defence mechanism. <laughs> but, yes. um, well, quite, yes. Um, is it time for my Bernays quote? Sure. It's always time for my Bernays. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, this Bernays quote is very, very familiar to us, and I'm sure to some of our listeners, but it's just worth noting so this is 1929, the book Propaganda. Here goes, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organised habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. 
Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are moulded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. Mm. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organised. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. <laughs> in almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, 80 years on or however, 90 years on. It was 1920s, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, 1929. So coming up for 100 years. Mm. Yeah, it's just still so potent, but it's so incredible, that idea, because that just sounds like a conspiracy theory as well, doesn't it? The invisible government, yes. Yeah, the people behind the scenes. It does sound like that. Yeah. I like the way he paints it as necessary again. <laughs> yeah. It may not be totally wholesome, but it has to be. And hmm, I'm not sure it has to be. <laughs> it depends on the structures that you're dealing with. And if those structures say it is necessary, then perhaps the structures need to be changed. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one part of invisible government in this broader sense... No, but the corporation is part of the world of government, in a sense, isn't it? Um, mm. Having power over us. It is the media, of course. And we've got very famously now the Trusted News Initiative, which seems to be a big deal in the Western world, which was set up a couple of years ago, I think, through the BBC, um, which is a very Orwellian thing, mm. because it's self-claiming this trusted status, <laughs> and yet... What are they doing? That they are conspiring to, as far as I'm concerned, in some cases, or in many cases, to promote disinformation. Mm. There is some genuine news, of course, uh, but also to discredit what they call disinformation and misinformation, some of which is going to be genuine information. So, mm. you know, just to call themselves trusted is very Orwellian, I think. So they are a, an industry media collaboration, major news, global tech organizations. Mm. They say to stop the spread of disinformation where it poses risk of real world harm mm -hmm. well what they consider to be disinformation <laughs> or misinformation um and they've got part this is 2019 they are partnered uh, here we go afp the bbc cbc radio canada european broadcasting union facebook financial times first draft google youtube the hindu microsoft reuters reuters institute for the study of journalism twitter the wall street journal that's quite a chunk of media there, wow. um, including, of course, big tech, very significant. And they're all, essentially, they're all saying we're going to sing from the same hymn sheet here. Mm. So what chance is there for real journalism to happen? If there's a point of view, they've all agreed they're going to go with the point of view. Is that a British uh, organisation? Is, isn't it? Well, I think it started with the BBC. Oh, okay. I may be wrong about that. I'll, I'll double check on that. Um, but they've all gone along with it. So hence you get the same messaging and, you know, these tech firms going along with it and censoring things accordingly, censoring alternative voices, mm. not officially sanctioned messages. <laughs> <laughs> but then you've got other things as well. Just a couple I came across, Project Syndicate. I don't know very much about them, but a little quote, Project Syndicate produces and delivers original high-quality commentaries to a global audience featuring exclusive contributions by prominent political leaders, policymakers, scholars, business leaders, civic activists from around the world. We provide news media and their readers with cutting-edge analysis and insight regardless of ability to pay. Our membership includes over 500 media outlets, wow. more than half of which receive our commentaries for free wow. or at subsidised rates in 156 countries. And they claim we often play an agenda-shaping role for other news organisations. So, you know, there's a point of view. Uh, we have Project Origin, and a quote from them, misinformation is a growing threat to the integrity of the information ecosystem. Having a provable source of origin for media, and knowing that it's not been tampered with en route, will help to maintain confidence in news from trusted providers. Mm -hmm. BBC, CBC, Radio Canada, New York Times, Microsoft, you know, involved with the, with this. Wow. So um, that's about giving a kind of digital imprimatur to in inverted commas, trusted sources. So you've got these organisations, these collaborations going on. Um, just to make sure everybody's saying the same thing. Wow. 
Yeah. All part of the uh, invisible government, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah. I like how Facebook and Twitter are now media sources. Because <laughs> yeah. I suppose they are, aren't they, really? Mm. Yeah. I suppose in, um, if that was an American organization, they'd probably use, I'm not joking about this, national security, wouldn't they? Yes. That's really their buzz phrase, because then the fear comes in. So harmful disinformation. So I think in America, they say that would threaten national security. They would use that phrase for sure. I mean, it's I believe it's understood as securitization. It's a theory, isn't it, um, in politics, mm. where you claim that something is a threat to national security, whether it is or not. <laughs> you you could just yeah. securitize something. Um, we've seen this with health. One little example here in the UK was originally it was called Public Health England, mm. and they've changed the name. Although I think they split it into two parts or something. But nevertheless, the name has changed, and they've not changed it to Public Health UK, which is what you think they would do. Mm. It's now UK Health Security Agency. <laughs> well, so they've securitized the business of health. So now it's a threat to national security if, let's say. What, another variant comes along? Omicron. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the use of language, I mean, sage. Oh. It's not an accident. No. There's no way in a million years that's an accident because they, they probably tried to get away with guru, but it didn't quite work. <laughs> yes. But sage, you know, a sage is a, is a person with wisdom. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's not an accident. <laughs> I totally agree with you. You know? Yes. I don't think Omicron is an accident, is it? I mean, it should have been, what was it? We got to the mu variant yeah and then it was suggested the world health organization might come up with new but then obviously mm. they thought well new doesn't sound like a name it just sounds like the new variant so okay we'll skip that one yeah. and then the next one would have been xi but it's spelled xi so that would have been like xi president xi of china so they thought oh we better right. avoid that one because we don't know was like the chinese yeah. and then the next one is omicron sounds like a monster yeah it sounds like transformers you know the megatron scary monsters scary monsters so that was a real find that was for them i think yeah there's so much presumption just built into it. And, you know, if we're talking media, again, a point we've made so many times is how slick it is and how they even talk in a strange voice. Oh, yeah. It's delivered with a certain rhythm. It's a lull. Yeah, and it comes across as very dispassionate. Mm. You know, we, we've gone way beyond the days where, you know, Walter Cronkite can announce JFK's killing and put down his glasses and look like he's about to burst into tears. I mean, that's an incredible <laughs> bit of footage, isn't it? Mm. But it's very, quote-unquote, unprofessional, you know, it's very amateur. <laughs> you know what I mean? In inverted commas, yes. you know, that, that wouldn't fly today because it's too emotional. You know, you've got to be dispassionate. Mm. Well, there's so much presumption still tied in with it, the way it's delivered. Mm. I think that the newsreader can frown and they can look concerned, mm. but I agree, they can't go too far because mm. they're an informed and respectable friend who is staring <laughs> at you through the screen and you of course you think it's just you you don't realize you're being we don't think about the fact that you're being dressed along with millions of people sharing you say lots of background assumptions um but yes they'll they'll look at you in that yeah. sort of friendly and concerned way but authoritative at the same time yeah yeah and you get people you know on the bbc i mean they're a safe pair of hands aren't they mm. that's the best way to describe them they're not going to yeah. say anything because the idea, I think Chomsky said it to uh, Andrew Marr. Oh, yes. Andrew Marr, yeah. Yes. That famous talk they had. And what he was saying, he didn't really say this explicitly, but what he was saying was that if you didn't toe the line, there's a hundred, hundreds of journalists yes. just aching yes. for a chance to write for a national newspaper, and they will essentially self-censor, mm. kind of subconsciously. They probably know they're doing it at the point they're doing it, but it's just sort of built in that you, know, you won't have a job if you don't do that. Yes, it's something like yeah. you wouldn't be where you are unless you thought that way, isn't it? Something along those lines, yeah. Yeah. He's exactly right. And I, I sent you a clip a few weeks ago of um, Jeremy Vine, who's an incredibly safe pair of hands. Yes. I just find him unbelievably bland. Yeah. Yeah. And he was having one, one of his afternoon phone-ins about the vaccine, but it was nothing to do with questioning the vaccine. It was some other point about it. And someone actually managed to get on the show by telling his researcher they wanted to talk about one point, but then they actually started questioning it. But Jeremy Vine's so entrenched in that, you know, his persona, let's call it, that, you know, all he wanted to talk about was, well, why did you lie to our researchers to get on the air? <laughs> you know, and it's, yeah. you know, as if the idea that it's much more important to follow the phone in we're doing at the moment than to make a valid point that goes against our whole thing. But it's uh, what I call the propaganda of presumption, you know. Mm. Um, but I honestly think things are changing. I really do. I don't think young people buy into this too much then i'm quite hopeful <laughs> should i be uh i don't know i find that very difficult to judge yeah uh, i'm certainly very pleased to see 
the protests that have been going on. Mm. I know people have different concerns. You know, not not everybody's protesting about the same things, of course. Yeah. Um, but to see people out in their hundreds of thousands around the world, maybe millions when you count everybody around the world in cities, you know, hundreds of cities around the world, all protesting at the same time. Yeah, that's certainly encouraging. I find it encouraging going to a stand in the park on a Sunday um, mm. and speaking to people and knowing that there are thousands of these meetings going on around the world at the same time. Um, again, I disagree with people about stuff, and that's fine. We have these conversations. It's just so brilliant to have a conversation, mm. even though we disagree, but in an open way. I mean, there are people talking about a flat earth or, you know, a hollow earth, and they say, yeah, well, no, I don't go along with that, but it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, we agree that our freedoms are being threatened, human rights are being threatened, the growth of authoritarianism. We need to do what we can to stand against that. This is what matters. So, yeah, to see these protests going on, that's great. And it's really interesting, isn't it, that so little of that is being recognised by the legacy media. Um, if it gets reported on at all, they'll focus on some shop window that's broken and say, oh, they're all rioters. It doesn't matter that it's like naught point mm. naught naught one percent of the people who are there. That doesn't matter. They'll focus on that. Yeah. Um, I've actually had a little bit of direct experience with that because um, right. I was around London, I think it was 2010, when they were going to double the tuition fees. And I mean, I wasn't actually a student, but uh, I was, uh, you know, I'd been involved with a few groups and stuff. And they organized a peaceful protest and it was completely peaceful. And I actually saw this with my own eyes. It was someone's, someone smashed a shop window or something like that. Mm. And all the media were there. They just immediately zeroed in on this person. And when I saw it on the news, you know, they just focused in on that. I was like, they've got no intention of covering this in a fair way. And then the same night or a night later, the Pink Floyd guitarist's son climbed up on a statue when he was drunk or something. And again, loads of news. And someone threw an egg at Charles and Camilla's car. Do you remember that? Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> and that became yeah. the story. So, like I say, I've got direct experience of this. and We know this happens. And it self-perpetuates, doesn't it? Because, of course, what the journalist is going to do, the cameraman's going to do, is to focus on that because that is a story. Mm. Uh, but they know that's really safe to do because that's going to fit with what the producer wants anyway. So mm. <laughs> it reinforces itself, doesn't it? Mm. There's no incentive for the cameraman to look the other way. Well, oh yeah, there's an egg thrown over there, but we'll, yeah, we'll ignore that. But actually, look at all these peaceful people here. That's not even a news story. And they'll get patted on the back by their producer mm. if they um, discredit what's going on. Yeah, and in fact, they can argue that it's what the viewers want as well, because it's more exciting yes. and more interesting yes. to see a, a window being smashed exactly. than a bunch of peaceful protesters. And it is. It is more exciting. But it's also more mm. infuriating if you think the same way as the protesters. You think, well, yeah. we're being misrepresented here. Mm. Yeah. And again, how, how much of the viewers... Use the word conditioned, but... You know, this has happened over a number of years. You know, Neil Postman did that amazing book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, mm. where he's just pointing out how we went, I think he was talking about America, but I think it would apply everywhere, went from a book culture to a TV culture. And a massive change. You know, attention spans get shorter. You're much more focused on visuals. Mm. You know, so it is a really hard-line conditioning. So someone might actually say, well, no, I do prefer... It was a more interesting news story. And that's true, Mm. But that's not a good thing. <laughs> no, um, no, no. I wasn't saying it was a good thing. It, it, no, just, no, I know. Yeah, just a fact. Yeah. yeah, they know how to play the game. That's the dangerous part of it. They can say, "Well, we are giving people what they want," and that is kind of true. <laughs> but mm. what we are probably advocating for is a world that's more um, contemplation of things. I don't know. Indeed, well, it's not responsible. You're giving people what they want, but it's, that's not always a responsible thing to do, is it? Because you can say, well, you know, people like to eat desserts all day, maybe. Exactly. <laughs> no, yeah. When you have the power of the media, where you can influence people, you should behave in a much more responsible way. Well, that's a very good analogy you made, really, because that's, uh, yeah, if you think of junk food, this is junk media. Yes. You know, it's, there's no intellectual stimulation involved in it at all. It's just easy entertainment. Yeah, that's a very good, Julian. That's brilliant. <laughs> And it n neatly fits into what a, a government narrative is. So, yeah, it's win-win for the people producing that yeah. media. But it's like, yeah, feeding someone a hamburger <laughs> and saying, well, they look very happy with that hamburger. And you don't see the sort of crash about an hour later. <laughs> And another thing I want... Oh, yeah, the, go on. Sorry. Go on, go on. No, one thing I wanted to add is because we've talked about this as being kind of neutral in the sense of these things are happening and then the media is responding to that. But I don't want to discount the fact that you can have agent provocateur. It's very difficult, of course, to ever to prove that it happens, although it mm. did highly arguably happen 
just for example, in Canada, back I think in, I think it was 2007, um, this was to do with the, the SPP, the so-called North American Security Prosperity Partnership that was being considered for um, the US, Canada, and Mexico. Oh, yeah. And there were protests in Quebec around that. And there were some people who appeared in the crowd, one of whom was carrying a rock. Mm. And the protest was saying, it. Who, who are these people? We don't know who these are. And then they sort of retreated behind the police line and the police kind of pretended to arrest them and take them off. And it turned out they were police officers oh, yeah, dressed yeah. as protesters. That was actually publicly admitted. Of course, they said they weren't doing anything wrong, you know, just trying to keep order in the crowd. But then, you know, why carry a rock? That doesn't make sense to me. That smacks of agent provocateur technique, you know, to discredit what was going on. Yeah. So I'm not saying that could never happen in these situations. I think it probably does in some cases. Yeah. Well, it's the equivalent of um, Cass Sunstein saying we should infiltrate conspiracy theory forums. Yes. They're infiltrating activist demonstrations. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that uh, there's no way that hasn't happened, you know. <laughs> mm, oh, um, of course. So it's yet another tactic. And um, I'd like to come back to mm. Cass Sunstein there, because <laughs> mm. I think you're right. Obviously, they did advocate cognitive infiltration. So you know, maybe the state should get involved with having people join internet chat rooms and try to confuse matters, that sort of thing. But actually a point that Tom Secker made, our friend Tom Secker, um, and I think it's a, mm. one of those big points that he made, you know, with Tom I find every now and again there's a gem that is just really crucial, and this is one of them. He made the point to me that that essay produced by Kassenstein and Adrian von Müller was itself the primary act of cognitive infiltration. Mm. But although it advocated doing this, the very fact that that was published and was read by so many people and shared by so many people, created a paranoia within the truth movement where people thought anybody who disagrees with me is a shill, mm. is a government agent. So it was really clever. It itself was a form of cognitive infiltration. And as I said before, this same guy, Cass Sunstein or Cass Sunstein, I suppose, is involved in nudge theory, the very thing we've been talking mm. about. And of course, one key thing about this is saving money. I can't actually pick oh, up the quote, but Spy B, I can't remember who, who said it, but one of them said, you know, doing this kind of manipulation, this behavioral nudging sort of thing is a very efficient way of doing things. Mm. It means you don't have to spend so much money on making laws. You can make these tweaks that are relatively easy and save an awful mm. lot of money, and yet you can achieve the same objective in an objectionable way. They don't think it's objectionable. I do. Um, yeah. But that article we just talked about by Cass Sunstein, Adrian Vermula, mm. perfect example of that. How cheap was that to produce that article, have it published? And yet, what was the effect of that? Fantastic example of nudge theory in itself. Well, yeah. Yeah, so it's very efficient. <laughs> I sound like I'm thinking it's wonderful. I don't. I think it's hideous. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just trying to draw attention to the fact of just how powerful it is. We should be aware that that kind of thing is going on. It's subtly manipulated by really cheap tricks. Yeah. Yeah, the word admire is probably not the best one to use, but I, I can see that it's very clever, you know? Mm. Yes. I mean, I could look at, um, I don't know, Goebbels or something like that. I don't think he's a great guy, but <laughs> no. you, know, you could admire you can admire the skill. It's quite impressive. And that will actually help you be more humble, perhaps, and say, well, yeah, I am malleable to this because it's mm. damn clever. It's well, clever. not all of it is, but <laughs> some of it no, is. No, no. But what we've just been talking about is certainly clever. Um, mm. But despicable. And as you brought up Joseph Goebbels, let's have a quote from him. Now, this appears in uh, Jacques Ellul's book, Propaganda. Quote, mm. we do not talk to say something, but to obtain a certain effect. Mm. Well, now, that seems to fit quite well what's going on. Mm. Yeah, I listened, to, I listened to a TED talk about how words have energy. Mm. And uh, this is absolutely true. Again, I, as a language teacher, I can attest to this. Mm. And they did an experiment where they... Um, it was eyewitnesses to a car accident. I don't know if it was simulated. Perhaps it was. They asked one group, at what speed did the car collide with the other car? Then they asked another group, at what speed did the car smash into the other car? And, I mean, you can almost guess the result hmm. because that word smash hmm. has a certain energy. Hmm. Words have energy, and that's why well, this is very, very clever in many ways because they know trigger words and buzzwords and things like that. Yes. It, but, again, us being aware of it. Well, I want to defend... You're saying that words have energy. That can sound sort of new agey and uh, touchy feely, and mm. you know, because oh, they don't have energy, they're just words. But actually, yeah, they do. I think so because 
I remember speaking to a physicist and getting to the point, you know, in the conversation, everything mm. boils down to energy, you know. And then I said, well, you know, what's energy? Mm. And they said, well, you know, the final analysis, energy is the ability to do something. Mm. <laughs> in other words, you can only go so far with your analysis in a um, reductionist sense. Mm. And then the reduction breaks and you have to think in terms of other things. And that's what it was. You know, it's the ability to do something in a certain context. Well, that's what you're saying about words. They have an energy. Well, because they have an ability to do something in a given context. So you're absolutely right. It's a perfectly good word to use. They do have energy. Or engender a reaction, I think, is perhaps even more. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah. So something like national security, it doesn't have the same impact as smash or crash or something like that. But it obviously does mm. engender a reaction. Yes. But, uh, yes. yeah, manipulation of language, wow. Well, there's another five hours of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Language. Oh, I've got loads of notes about language here. Oh, you go for it. Here we go. Um, vaccine hesitancy. Mm. We've been talking about vaccine hesitancy for a long time. And, of course, hesitancy is a bad thing, isn't it? Mm. You see, because we have that phrase, he who hesitates is lost. Yeah. And I've been saying for ages, I'm not vaccine hesitant. I'm vaccine cautious. Now, being cautious is good. Mm. Because they don't use that word because they want to make sure that it's seen to be a bad thing to be not just taking the vaccine without thinking about it. So there you go. I think even that term, vaccine hesitancy, is manipulative. Mm. Um, I think the term the vaccine is also manipulative because it's not true that there's a vaccine. I mean, in the UK, there's Oxford, AstraZeneca, there's Pfizer, BioNTech. But it causes people, I think, not to think so much about the differences between them. We're aware there are differences, but we don't tend to think about it so much because we're encouraged to think, oh, it's just the vaccine. Mm. We talked about mask wearing. I think they function as language. Now, whatever the health benefits that could be argued for them, I'm not convinced myself, but some argue, I think that pales into insignificance compared with their function as language to say things to each other by wearing them mm. i think that therefore falls under propaganda there is an area of philosophy called speech act theory and part of that theory is non-verbal communication mm. so you can say things by what you do non-verbal actions can say things as long as there's some sort of convention of understanding between the person doing it and the person receiving the message they can function as language mm. and so yeah they can be a social cue distancing can work in the same way and in fact mm. communication theory um, has proxemics. So, of course, distancing would be part of proxemics, wouldn't it? You know, where you actually stand says something. Mm. Um, there's haptics, which is touch communication. So, of course, we were told not to shake hands. We were told to bump elbows. Well, that says something. Mm. So all, all these things, I think, have been quite consciously applied. Mm. Um, there's the term of the science, which I talked about with um, Phil Saker. Well, there's, there isn't the science or following of the science. It really means follow the narrative because science, mm. true science, of course, there's always a dialogue and a debate. Um, we have safe and effective for the vaccines. Well, maybe, but, you know, <laughs> do I have reason to think they might not be safe or might not be as effective as you say they are? Well, maybe we're not allowed to think that. We're just told safe and effective, safe and effective. Mm. How about pandemic of the unvaccinated? Mm. Well, how can it be a pandemic of the unvaccinated when vaccinated people are able to catch this virus and shed it? Mm. It doesn't really make much sense, does it? It's just a way of getting at people and shaming people and othering people who have not done as they're told. Mm. How about horse dewormer oh, for yeah. ivermectin? Mm. Well, it is, but it's also been given to billions of people over the years. So it's also a human medication, but we won't talk about that. We'll talk about it being a horse dewormer to make anybody who takes ivermectin for COVID-19 specifically, that is, look absolutely crazy um, and irresponsible. Uh, I could go on forever. <laughs> yeah, I think we've gone way beyond the point where a lot of these messages actually do make sense. Mm. Yeah, there's just so much evidence, so many examples people give of contradictions, but Again, it has a certain, just to use that word again, energy, or it has a certain impact. I think impact yep. is probably a better word, actually. Hmm. No, I like um, energy. I think that's good. Mm. Okay. But going back to your point about contradictions and, and things mm. not making sense or seeming not to make sense, I want to share something that I came across recently, which I think might have some bearing upon this. Okay. It's a collection of documents produced by the CIA back in the 1960s. Mm. It's called Kubark. A code name, don't know what it stands for anyway, it's a CIA code name, declassified, you can read it, and it's to do with counterintelligence interrogation, detailing how to go about interrogating people, coercive technique, so it's you know, borderline torture. Hmm. And one of the techniques 
is called the Alice in Wonderland technique. Mm -hmm. So let me just read this. The aim, this is from the document itself, the aim of the Alice in Wonderland or confusion technique is to confound the expectations and conditioned reactions of the interrogatee. He is accustomed to a world that makes some sense, at least to him, a world of continuity and logic, a predictable world. He clings to this world to reinforce his identity and powers of resistance. Hmm. So that was an interesting point. <laughs> your powers of resistance are linked to your identity, linked to your understanding of the world. Hmm. Okay, let me continue. The confusion technique is designed not only to obliterate the familiar, but to replace it with the weird. Wow. Although this method can be employed by a single interrogator, it is better adapted to use by two or three. Hmm. When the subject enters the room... The first interrogator asks a double-talk question, one which seems straightforward but is essentially nonsensical. Mm. Whether the interrogatee tries to answer or not, the second interrogator follows up, interrupting any attempted response with a wholly unrelated and equally illogical query. Mm. Sometimes two or more questions are asked simultaneously. Pitch, tone, and volume of the interrogator's voices are unrelated to the import of the questions. No pattern or questions and answers is permitted to develop, mm. nor do the questions themselves relate logically to each other. In this strange atmosphere, the subject finds that the pattern of speech and thought, which he has learned to consider normal, have been replaced by an eerie meaninglessness. Mm. The interrogatee may start laughing or refuse to take the situation seriously. But as the process continues, day after day, if necessary, the subject begins to try to make sense of the situation, which becomes mentally intolerable. Now, he's likely to make significant admissions yeah. or even to pour out his story just to stop the flow of babble which assails him. Mm. This technique may be especially effective with the orderly, obstinate type. Now, I don't know if that's had any direct influence over what's going on now, but, mm. you know, we, we live in a world that's so full of contradictions and confusion. I wonder if, at the very least, if, if some of these behavioural psychologists are tapping into similar and similarly objectionable intellectual traditions, you know, to disorient us, to, to get us to comply. Wow, that's very interesting. Because that's how we can find resolution to this mental turmoil. I do wonder. Yeah, I mean, uh, things like police interrogation techniques and, uh, as you said, torture techniques, they're really worth studying. And I've studied it a little bit. You know, there's the idea of the good cop, bad cop, mm. which is designed to confuse the person. So one person will either be babbling at them or be very aggressive towards them. And they'll just be aching for the other person to say, well, let me just summarize that for you. It's almost like, yeah. it's almost like Sir Humphrey and Hacker with the government documents, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's like, I can't bear to read any more of this. <laughs> well, here's a one page summary. It, mm. That that's, is really what I think the news is providing. Uh, I'm not saying it in a good way, but what they feel they're providing. Oh, they're the good cop. Yeah, yeah. The, sort of like <laughs> yeah. the simplification of it. But yeah, I mean, that is 100% a tactic is just either babble at someone or just give them so much information that's either incredibly boring or incredibly confusing mm. that they're just crying out for the good cop to just say, well, here's a nice, neat summary of it. Mm -hmm. There's definitely something in that, yeah, for sure. I think so. Go back to that example. How often have we found ourselves you know, sitting in front of some media and we receive an you know, official position, this is the way it is, and then 24 hours later it's changed. And before you can start thinking about, just a minute, this is the opposite advice as what I was given 24 hours ago. It's just this babble of confusion conflicting voices and by the time you've tried to make sense of it it's moved on again and does that not have the effect with some people just to say oh you know just tell me what to do and i'll do it it could well be yeah i mean i i'll be honest I, i've got i think it was uh do you remember in 2014 all the stuff with ukraine hmm. i think that was actually the point where i got i started to feel very very jaded and i did step back quite a lot yeah and i feel like i've never been as well informed well, you know relatively speaking as i was yeah. then I was very engaged, but I, I got worn down. Uh, the stuff with Syria as well, you know. I, so again, we're, we're all we're all susceptible to it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, I do have moods where I I feel, oh, can I really be bothered to repel this propaganda? Mm. Wouldn't it be easier just to take the uh, blue pill, you know, <laughs> rather than the red pill? Yeah, take the but blue pill. The thing that gets yeah. me more from these Kubark documents is it's not so much the Alice in Wonderland stuff, but it's the sections on fear. Oh, right, right. Um, let, let me just read this. It's quite short. 
Mm. The threat of coercion usually weakens or destroys resistance more effectively than coercion itself. Mm. The threat to inflict pain, for example, can trigger fears more damaging than the immediate sensation of pain. In fact, most people underestimate their capacity to withstand pain. Mm. The same principle holds for other fears. Sustained long enough, a strong fear of anything vague or unknown induces regression, whereas the materialization of the fear, the infliction of some form of punishment, is likely to come as a relief. Mm. The subject finds that he can hold out and his resistances are strengthened. In general, direct physical brutality causes only resentment, hostility, and further defiance. End quote. Mm. And I just think, you know, take all this talk about vaccine mandates. And I know it's not it's not just talk. I mean, mandates are happening in many places and people are losing their jobs, etc. And of course, we have Austria and possibly Germany mm. on our minds and other places. And, and we have this dreadful Ursula von der Leyen suggesting maybe EU countries should have a conversation about mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations, which Boris Johnson mm. has recently echoed as well, which tells you what those two think about fundamental human rights. But um, so, so I know that's going on, but but I do wonder if, for the propagandist, the threat is actually more powerful than the thing itself. For example, you know, with Austria, they could carry this out straight away, but they're not. They say they're going to wait till February so as to enhance the fear by the threat. Mm. That's the sort of thing that tends to get to me more, you know, uh, worrying about what's going on and feeling more fearful about things and then thinking, can I be bothered anymore? Can we bother? And of course, mm. you know, when I'm in a better mood and I've had a sleep and <laughs> a cup of coffee, I feel, yeah, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> I can carry on because it's essential. It's who I am. If I, if I give up on the dictates of my conscience, then I might as well be dead, frankly. Yes. Um, so, yeah, you come back to your senses, don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, Mark Christopher Miller identified fear and anger as the things that you want to induce in people if you want to manipulate them. Yes. So fear and anger. Mm. Another one of my mantras, I suppose, because I think fear stops people doing things. And if they actually just did it, they'd finally had many more resources than they think. We're getting into the area of life coaching a bit here. But life and life only, essentially, I found a nice kind of link. It's a sort of inner truth. It's a sort of right. getting yourself yeah. sort of armor plated, you know, with all this awareness of propaganda. And then the outer truth is about how you receive what you're given mm. so I've, I've found a nice tie-in with the podcast this year but um i can tell you categorically people have way more inner resources than they realize mm. but fear is just it's a it's a fantastic weapon i mean our friend adam curtis i mean <laughs> if you if you, <laughs> if you thought if you thought hyper normalization was a bit long-winded i i watched these can't get you out of my head and so many people are going oh it's brilliant and i just thought it's like hypernormalization on steroids. It was like another <laughs> 10 hours or whatever of just this rambling thing. But one of the things he got right was the power of nightmares. Mm. It's about how modern politicians, and he was talking in the sort of Bush Blair era, how their role now is to become, don't worry, I'll save you from the boogeyman. Mm. That was good. You know, and that's a subtle shift from the way things used to be. Mm. Again, it's like, oh, don't worry, I'll protect you from the monsters. Well, I mean, you saying... The fact that we have more inner resources than we often think we do mm. brings us on to something that we've been aiming towards, I suppose, a few times during the conversation is solutions. <laughs> you know, talking about the problem, mm. what can we do? Um, that's one thing, of course, to remind ourselves and each other that we are stronger than we are encouraged to believe we are by these various techniques. Mm. Seeing these techniques for what they are is a help in that respect. It's not just me that's confused. I'm I'm being made confused. I'm being deliberately made to feel fearful um, self-awareness in that respect. And as you say, we do have inner resources. We have mm. inner energy. We have the ability to do <laughs> in a context more than we realize we do. I think that's all true. Mm. And of course, from a spiritual perspective, I would also bring that in as well, that um, you know, through faith in God, we also have the ability to do that he also can give us in a relationship with him. Now, one major thing that I think is important is a kind of negative energy of non-compliance. Because <laughs> mm. a lot of this propaganda is aimed at getting us to behave. You know, that's one of the things that Jacques Alul said, you know, it's aimed mostly at changing our behavior. One of the antidotes to this then is not to do, is not to behave. Mm. 
And this does connect with non-compliance. We're so often told we have to do this, we have to do that. Just now we're told we've got to wear masks again in shops. Yeah. And there are so many voices now, which I echo, say, look, if we all were just to say no, enough is enough is the big phrase that's been in these protests a lot. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. If this is unreasonable, this is stepping over the line, this cannot be defended rationally or morally, no, we won't go there. No, we won't. And if we all say no, and of course, that's the big thing. How can we all say no? But if we all say no, then this stops right. so this is a sort of not behaving mm. going right against the behavioralists because if we don't behave you know in this absolute sense we just don't do then they can't have that power over us because we're not just not doing um it's over yeah willful disobedience that's right sorry to interrupt me. yeah yeah but yes but in in it's that can sound like it's um again like a positive thing mm. but what i'm talking about is this neutral thing that's sort of it's just ceasing we're asked to do it we're no no we're not going to do it because that's to behave. And it is the province of these behavioural psychologists to get us to behave in the right ways. And we just say, no, I'm not going to behave. Mm. And of course, the difficulty is to get people to understand that um, and on board with that, which of course is what all this media is about. So many voices saying similar things in their own ways. Mm. Um, that's why I think this media is important. Yeah. And I think you know, come back to a stand in the park. I'm quite enthusiastic about it. Mm. It's because it allows that sort of thought. It is, in a sense, a little instance of that. We're standing there. We're not doing anything except talking, you know? Yeah, but nice. we're behaving in a kind of neutral way. The, the state wouldn't want us to behave that way. It wants us to be isolated in our little homes, watching the messages from the TV instead. We turn all that off. We're out there standing in the park, standing in our truth, whatever that might be, um, talking about things that the state doesn't want us to talk about. Um, it's very low-level energy and is hardly behaving at all. <laughs> um, mm. But it goes in the opposite direction of all that we've been talking about today. We're just being ourselves, not being products of the state, mm. products of propaganda. Yeah, maybe appearing relaxed is uh, some sort of nudge to other people. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know. our own nudge. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we're talking about spiritual stuff, then mm. Buddhism. One one of the big things in Buddhism is detachment. Right. And um, again, it's not detachment from the world. It's detachment from reacting to. Uh, yeah, call it propaganda or call it whatever the messages, whatever the messages are. Right. When I stop watching the TV, just for example, I stop buying clothes. Uh -huh. And some people enjoy buying clothes. I'm not knocking that per se. But for me, I was just spending loads and loads of money on clothes that I didn't really need. Mm. So turning off from the messages and sort of, in, in a funny way, demonstrating that to other people, you can make a statement. Yeah, that is a statement being made, isn't it? Mm. I think it is. Mm. And it does connect with both spiritual traditions, actually, as you say, with Buddhism, but also mm. with Christianity, something that's not often talked about but there is a, a spiritual detachment tradition biblical tradition with christianity that you find it in paul particularly articulated in paul mm. um i did a little sermon actually on the podcast i think it was called holding things lightly or something like that based upon one of the i remember that yeah, yeah, yeah. well paul was well, this is really to paraphrase you know essentially saying you know you've got to live in this world but you know the world lets you down in various ways so don't be invested. Don't invest your very being in the world. Yeah. Value things, love people, but you are detached. Your value, who you are. So when the world crashes around you, you don't crash with it. It's that kind of thing. Um, so there is a, you know, there are truths there yeah. that coincide between those two faith traditions. Yeah. I connect with that very much. Yeah. I mean, that's something you can do in your daily life, you know. Mm. Yeah, it's for your own good and for, I don't know, I'd argue the good of society. <laughs> yes, yeah. And just making a decision, I'm not going to turn on the radio, turn on the TV, watch the news and react to it. Yes. It's one of those things that's simple but not easy, maybe. Well, I think it is quite easy, actually, if you get in a habit of it. But I think it's the difficulty is to remain aware of it because mm. there are so many little ways in which we could do that. Mm. But it's remaining conscious of that set of decisions all the time isn't it because you can just go into automatic mode we do so often so perhaps we need to do a kind of here and now experiment i love that phrase mm. <laughs> here and now so i'm here i'm now what am i being manipulated with now yeah ah it's that well i won't do that then i'll do something else mm. i'll do what i want to do <laughs> um perhaps if we keep that consciousness before us as much as possible we may find ourselves being more ourselves than products of the propaganda Something you said earlier, I think, about following your instincts. So you said um, 
sometimes you feel a bit jaded and you stop following what's going on, but then yeah. your instinct takes over and you come back to it. Mm. Mm. Again, I think the best way to discover who you are is to constantly take a step back. Mm. Again, I, I don't want to presume people's behavior, but I imagine a great many people, they wake up with an alarm clock, which is fair enough, you've got to wake up for work and stuff. And then they probably turn a radio on or whatever they turn on. Yes. You know, and in, in the kind of hazy state, I know this because it takes me about an hour to get out of this every morning. <laughs> the hazy state where you wake up, you are somehow a bit more suggestible. Mm. Um, Do you know I'm guilty of this? I've got to tell you. <laughs> yeah, because right. of all that's been going on, I have tended to turn on my little tablet, find out what's going on. Not necessarily, you know, the BBC news. Mm. Although I might cross-reference some other things with that. But yeah, quite early in the day. Mm. Sometimes, oh, I wonder what so-and-so has said. And that's not always a good thing. Because yeah. um, sometimes I find myself just doing it without even thinking about it. There's an the impulse to do it. Mm. So that in itself is a bit conditioned, isn't it? So maybe I should mm -hmm. tell myself off about that one and do that far less. Just get up in the morning and not do that first, um, if at all. Put you in for one meeting of Propaganda Anonymous and you'll be fine. <laughs> Every <laughs> yes. time you stray, you yes. have to go back there. But no, uh, yeah, so maybe just a little experiment people can do is not listen to the news for a couple of hours after you wake up, you know, get yourself ready for the day. Yeah. And then maybe either not listen to it then or... Because <laughs> yeah. I have the same, you know, it's, it's an instinct to put the radio on in the bathroom while you're having a shower or shaving, whatever it is. <gasps> yes. But then you, you're, you're in that slightly suggestible state and it's not a good start to the day, mm. in my opinion. <laughs> no. Can I come back to spiritual stuff? I've got to. Sorry, it's just because that's where I'm coming from. My, I suppose is one of my spiritual mentors way back. People who listen to the Mind Renewed will recognize the name Brian Austin. Ran a Christian bookshop in London. Had a huge impact on me. One of the things he said, you know, when you get up in the morning, don't turn the news on straight away. <laughs> this is exactly relevant to what we're talking about. He said, get some of the loving kindness of God into you. Because mm. what he meant was, you know, turn to the scriptures. Even just for a few minutes. Do that first. And so often... I don't do that, mm. you know? That would be the second thought, third thought, or maybe the hundredth thought in the day. And sometimes, you know, I might even forget about it. So in that case, I'm not being, being consistent with who I, who I am, believe myself to be. Mm. Um, that loving kindness of God, I think, is so important to draw upon. It puts everything else into context. Otherwise, the thing that's driving you is the fear and the, the conformity and whatever else that's being thrown at you from the page of the BBC or, or even some alternative source which is causing you to worry about something mm. would be concerned about something oh hot under the collar about it yeah i agree with that yeah okay all well and good but if i'm not in the day grounded in that loving kindness of the transcendent creator then you know i'm more manipulable yeah um yeah so it's just a little lesson to myself to remind myself to do that yeah and other, other people practice uh, gratitude that's one thing Mm. apparently that makes a huge impact in people's lives yes yeah you know, first thing in the morning maybe or when you're ready to face the day mm. just talk about the things you're grateful for make a good start to your day <laughs> well that's an interesting one because that's parasitical on theism i have to say sorry i've just got to check that in because if you're grateful you've got to be grateful to somebody right otherwise right. it doesn't mean anything <laughs> but you know no okay i'm not i'm not decrying people who do do that i think it's a good thing to do to be grateful to feel grateful mm. i would just ask those people to question and to think more logically about what they're doing mm. and what that implies yeah. <laughs> um but yeah um, i don't do that enough and somebody actually brought me up on that on the show once and said you know to feel thankful is a really good thing do you feel thankful each day and i had to admit oh no i, I suppose i don't really that's not the way i tend to articulate my spirituality but to be quite honest he pulled me up a little on that because I should be. I should do that more. Mm. I should be more grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, mm. very good. Um, I have to probably log out in five or ten minutes. So You do. Uh, so is there anything else we want to talk about? Um, from my side, you know, I've got other notes, but I think the main points have been made. I mean, I think this, mm. you'll have a bit of editing to do, but there's some real <laughs> gold in here today. Don't cut too much out, will you? Because it's <laughs> I won't. No, there's loads and loads in here. Yeah. Something I've got to mention, I think I have said it before, we've got to stress it. Mm. We, you and I, in having this conversation, we've said this so many times before, we're not somehow saying we're special, we're above all this. Mm. We are acknowledging that we also are victims of this. We only understand so much, but it's helpful to talk about it. It's helpful for us, hopefully helpful for people listening we make mistakes, we misinterpret things, 
we will be misunderstood in some respects, but having this conversation is important because it's only through having these kinds of conversation, as you said, changing the discourse, do we stand a chance of operating more as free thinkers? I don't mean free thinker in the atheistic sense, <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, just being free to be ourselves and, and have non-captured thoughts, mm-hmm. thoughts that are less captured than they would otherwise be. We're always going to have captured thoughts to some extent mm. um, and thereby to be freer and help others to be freer, acknowledging that we will never be completely free of any influences. Mm. I just thought, you know, we're, we're not being arrogant about this. We're not being know-alls about this. No. Um, we talked about this with my song, The Fool's Guide, didn't we? Yes. Well, you were saying that, are you saying the public are fools? And I'm saying, no, we're all yes, fools. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Potential. Exactly that. Potential to be, f- not fools, but to be fooled, which is a, is a slight distinction there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Excellent. Yeah, good conversation. Thanks very much for suggesting it and um, yes. yeah, having this, this good conversation. You're very welcome. Yeah. So my show is Life and Life Only. I guess we're sort of kind of guest hosting this. Mm. So thanks for being on Life and Life Only as well. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Look forward to next uh, conversation. Yeah. Uh, whenever that will be. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll have to cook up something as good as this. <laughs> oh, I'm sure the world of... Uh, politics and corporations and media will give us plenty of food for thought in future yeah that's probably why they're doing it actually i think that's their real reason <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah yeah forget the great reset <laughs> they want great podcasts <laughs> yeah. no it's been fantastic okay. thanks very much yes. thanks very much anthony good speech again all the best thank you show notes for this program can be found at the mind renewed the mind Podcast music by the brilliant Anthony Rajkoff, attribution non-commercial share alike 4.0 international. You have been listening to me, Julian Charles, and my guest, Anthony Rutuno, and I very much look forward to speaking to you again in the near future.